Good evening. I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, the inside story of a former interpreter's escape from Afghanistan. That was the moment that made me cry. His family's harrowing journey just to get to the Canadian plane. Also tonight, reversals on masking rules across the country. I kind of like, like that it's not up in the air anymore. From climate change to affordability, young Canadians talk about their vote. My ballot is more than just for me. It's for every single person that relies on my ballot. And for six decades, he was the cool, classy beat of the Rolling Stones. Condolences to the Stones. Charlie was a rock and a fantastic drummer. Rock and roll loses Charlie Watts. This is The National. It can be easy to get lost in the politics of what's happening in Afghanistan right now, to bypass the people, those desperate to get out after the Taliban takeover, some trying to get to Canada. Well, tonight, they are front and center. Tension is building because time is ticking. The U.S. plans to withdraw its troops in a week, and they are the ones securing the airfield that all countries are using. In the last five days, five Canadian flights have taken off carrying more than 1,300 people to safety. Some are Canadian citizens, others Afghan nationals destined for this country or elsewhere. Now, on one of those flights was a family of seven who will soon call Canada home. They're still en route, but they have endured so much just to get as far as they have. Stephen D'Souza tells their story through the photos, videos, and messages that they have been able to send. The path to freedom for one Afghan interpreter went through this canal of raw sewage filled with razor wire. From far away Canada, Sangin Abdul Mateen has been trying for a week to guide his brother to the airport. Both worked as interpreters for the Canadian forces. But every time the family tried to reach the destination given by Canadian authorities, they ran into Taliban checkpoints and desperate crowds. It's thousands of people. Um, yes, adult will make it. Um, in, in a couple hours to, you know, in that crowd. But if you have a children and a small kid, it's impossible. They found an alternate route. It meant going through sewage. But on the other side, Canadian soldiers. So his brother Rangin waded in. That's him in the light colored jacket. The moment I liked so much where my brother sends me the picture is that where the Canadian um, soldiers are holding their hands and trying to lift them up from the sewage water. That was the moment that made me cry. The next images brought a feeling neither brother had felt in weeks. Relief. Then joy, seeing him aboard the C-17 on his way to Canada, with so many others weary from the escape. We are waiting for the Canadian guys. But for every story of success, there are dozens more of sorrow. That same sewage canal is now overrun, including by other Afghans who worked as interpreters for Canada. And we are waiting for the last three hours in this canal. At another point into the airport, cries of Canadian seemingly go unanswered. Most of the people surrounding me, they doesn't have the proper paperwork. An Afghan contractor who worked for Canada says he's tried to reach the airport five times and failed. We're protecting his identity. He wants Canada to send buses to help them navigate the chaos outside the airport. People are running from the tanks and they were uh, beating the people. So it's too difficult. It's a difficult situation. How are you doing, brother? A difficult situation. Abdul Mateen is happy his brother has escaped. I am so happy to come to that country that they're helping and they're so helpful people. He still has many friends stranded, wading through the sewage, hoping to get pulled out. So his work is far from done. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Toronto. Now on the political side of all this, G7 leaders, including Justin Trudeau, met today to discuss the timing of the U.S. Army withdrawal. As Carolyn Dunn shows us, not everyone is on the same page. Safely at Ramstein Air Force Base in Germany, Afghan evacuees en route to the United States reflect on what they have escaped. The Taliban are beating them uh, and uh, they are firing on them, they are killing them and uh, it's, it's, it's uh, very hard to enter to the airport, yes. 
That danger, combined with the overwhelming crowds of people trying to escape, has put evacuations into gridlock. That's why G7 leaders today pressured the United States to walk back plans to withdraw troops next Tuesday to ensure more people get out. We are currently on a pace to finish by August the 31st. But U.S. President Joe Biden says they're sticking to the deadline and warned the Taliban if it wants them out to stay out of the way. But the completion by August 31st depends upon the Taliban continuing to cooperate and allow access to the airport for those who were, trans were transporting out. Through an interpreter, the Taliban spokesperson made its demands clear. We want them to evacuate all foreign uh, nationals by the 31st of August. And we are not in favor of uh, uh, allowing Afghans uh, to leave. But at a virtual G7 meeting, leaders made their own demands on the Taliban. They've got to guarantee right the way through, uh, through August the 31st and beyond, a safe passage, safe passage for those who who want to, to come out. Not only should they be letting uh, people have access to the airport in the coming days, uh, they need to make sure that in the coming uh, weeks, even beyond the deadline, people are able to leave Afghanistan. Justin Trudeau made a commitment the U.S. will not. Afghanistan. Canada is ready to stay beyond the 31st deadline uh, if it's at all possible. So, Carolyn, that's what was happening in front of the cameras today. Obviously, a lot more going on behind the scenes. Yeah, Adrian, what's really remarkable is how the U.S. is on one hand calling the Taliban a terror organization, and yet on the other hand negotiating daily with its leadership as if they're the government in waiting. In fact, the head of the CIA reportedly met with the de facto leader of the Taliban, Abdul Ghani Bardar, to talk about that August 31st deadline. That no longer secret meeting happened 11 years after the CIA and Pakistan arrested and imprisoned Bardar. Remarkable. Carolyn Dunn in Washington, thank you. Thanks. Well, turning to the COVID story now and an increasingly tough balancing act with back to school right around the corner and a fourth wave rising alarmingly fast. Several provinces are bringing back tougher public health measures. Katie Nicholson is in British Columbia where hospitalizations have doubled in the last two weeks. The last carefree days of summer before early bedtimes and school masking rules kick in. It was kind of hard because like my glasses fogged up, but once I got used to it, it was good. Guidelines announced today in British Columbia require kids and teachers from grade four and up to mask up. It's what it's asked. It's just like wearing a seatbelt in the car. You gotta follow the rules. I'm actually surprised they're not doing all mask K to 12. But a much bigger surprise was tucked away in today's announcement. So today I'm announcing we are reintroducing a mask requirement across British Columbia for all indoor public spaces. Not just school kids then, but adults too. A big reversal after dropping the mask mandate just last month. So I kind of like, like that it's not up in the air anymore. And BC isn't alone. Manitoba now also bringing back masks after relaxing its rules. As an additional protection measure against the rising Delta variant and a possible fourth wave, we are also announcing today that we are requiring mandatory mask use in all indoor public places. That rising threat prompting another reversal in Quebec. Which today hastily resurrected mask mandates for some schools. And that's why some are calling for even more mask rules for schools. What's more surprising is that the measures aren't stronger and that still other provinces still are leaving it up to uh, school boards or individuals' ch choice. In PEI, harsh criticism that its back-to-school plan was too wishy-washy when it came to masking pushed the premier to defend his chief public health officer. There's only one thing that has pissed me off, uh, sorry for the vernacular, but is that when our health professionals get attacked like they do. With the fourth wave rising fast, more anger and more rules are likely to follow. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Vancouver. Quebec is pushing ahead with its vaccine passport for non-essential services. That includes 
the bars, the gyms, the restaurant, but also the festival, the cinemas. And so starting September 1st, the rules will apply to everyone in Quebec 13 or older. It will be available on an app ready for downloading as of tomorrow. There will also be a paper version which can be printed or mailed. The list of organizations making, making vaccination mandatory got a little longer today. In Ontario, it's coming soon to the Toronto Police Services and the province's liquor retailer, the LCBO. And in Alberta, fans of the Edmonton Oilers will also need to prove they're vaccinated if they want to go to a game. Well, the Northwest Territories is reporting its first death from COVID-19. There are more than 200 active cases there right now, and the virus is spreading in remote communities. As Juanita Taylor tells us, territorial leaders are asking for more help on the ground. It's going to be just like Christmas. At the Dene Nation in Yellowknife, staff have been busy getting toys, puzzles and other activities ready to send to remote communities affected by COVID. If you have been in isolation, you will understand because, um, you know, it's long hours. You don't, some people don't have any contact with anyone and, you know, it's good for mental health. Something the 150 people who live in hard-hit Colville Lake will appreciate. The common law, my two babies are positive. My baby's been up all night crying, so I had to carry him around, give him Tylenol, and, you know, you just got to deal with it and just keep on going to the next day. And the federal government has sent Red Cross nurses to Yellowknife and asked volunteer rangers in several communities to help. What they're mainly going to be doing is you know, providing transport, providing distribution of supplies. I think a lot of communities are going to need supplies delivered to people that are isolated. But the territory's health minister says more help is needed from Ottawa, especially nurses. We're at an awkward time with the federal government because of the election that was declared on the same day that the outbreak was declared. I think they understand the urgency and they have already provided some resources. We need more, they know that. Yesterday, another community that tested wastewater found COVID in the samples. The Canadian Armed Forces says it can bring in more resources from outside the territory if the communities request it. But for now, they say they're managing as people pull together to help out their neighbours. Juanita Taylor, CBC News, Yellowknife. Well, more than 500 people in BC's interior will need to retake their vaccinations. That's because they were mistakenly given invalid doses stored in the wrong freezer at the wrong temperature. Officials say there's no added risk to having gotten one of those doses, but of course they will need a new shot. Health officials in Saskatchewan are apologizing tonight for a lab error that resulted in more than 100 people being told they had COVID-19 when they did not. There were more than 200 false positive tests, uh, most in the Regina area. About a quarter were from nursing homes that had declared outbreaks, most of which have now been reversed. On the federal election campaign, big promises are being made on Canada's affordable housing crisis. Today, it was the Liberals making those promises, but the Conservatives and the NDP have plans as well. David Cochran takes us through them all. In the middle of a scorching summer election, promises to help cool an overheated housing market. If you work hard, if you save, your dream of having your own place should be in reach. But for too many people, it just isn't. The Liberals are promising to boost supply by building 1.4 million homes over four years, pushing big cities to build middle-class homes, more affordable housing, and scaling up rent-to-own projects. For buyers under 40, there's a tax-free first home savings account and a home buyer's bill of rights that covers everyone. We'll crack down on the predatory speculators that stack the deck against you. you got six years so no more blind money. bidding. You got six years no to more foreign wealth like being A protester heckled Trudeau with a line that will sound familiar. He had six years to deal with this. If he cared about it, wouldn't the housing crisis not be here? Jugmeet Singh's solution is to build 500,000 affordable homes over 10 years, tax incentives to build rental units, and $5,000 a year to help families pay rent, with more policies to come. Mr. Trudeau's had six years and has failed. 
The Conservatives offer the same critique, but a different solution. They promise one million homes over three years by converting 15 percent of government real estate to housing, offering tax breaks to build rental housing and requiring municipalities to boost density to get transit money. Another target for all the parties, foreign buyers. The NDP wants to impose a 20% tax on housing sales to non-Canadians. The Liberals and the Conservatives would go even further, promising a ban on new foreign ownership for at least two years to see if that cools the market. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Widespread heat warnings continue to stretch through much of southern Ontario and parts of Quebec today. <laughs> Well, that looks nice, doesn't it, kids? Finding any way to cool off with daytime highs in the low 30s and the humidex making it feel closer to 40 in some parts. Environment Canada says the heat wave is expected to continue into Thursday. And these are some of the first images from the B.C. interior of the devastation caused by the White Rock Lake wildfire. Officials say more than 70 homes were destroyed and not far from the damage, a new wildfire broke out today, forcing the evacuation of several homes. More than 200 wildfires continue to burn in the province. And cleanup efforts are underway in Saskatchewan after at least two tornadoes touched down in the province last night. No injuries have been reported, but as Bonnie Allen shows us, the damage is significant for those already struggling through a devastating summer. At 66 years of age, Eugene Zakaluzny has lived his entire life on this farm in southwestern Saskatchewan. Now it's reduced to rubble. While Zakaluzny knew thunderstorm warnings were in effect last night, he never saw the tornado coming. The sun was shining and I looked out and about five minutes later and I seen the fuel tanks going across the yard and then I seen a truck going and then all of a sudden I seen, looked around and the buildings were all gone and it was like 30 seconds and it was done. He didn't even have time to hide. The twister tossed steel grain bins and trees around like toys, damaging most of his property. All the equipment and everything that was in there, uh, over a million dollars, I'm sure. Environment Canada says the weather in Saskatchewan is unusually volatile right now with more tornado warnings today. Okay, there's the funnel going to form right straight there. You can see it coming. Leon Jacobs and his wife captured this video last night before running for cover. We got halfway downstairs and all of a sudden it was just a roar. You couldn't hear a thing. It was just like a train. Now Jacobs is cleaning up tin from his shed scattered several kilometers away. We had insurance and, you know, nobody got hurt. That's the big thing, you know. I'm, it's just stuff. Jacobs is frustrated that he didn't receive a tornado alert until five minutes after the twister touched down on his farm. Environment Canada explains the delay. We have a very um, sparsely populated area uh, in Saskatchewan, so that if a tornado happens and nobody sees it, it's often very hard for us to warn it. As for Eugene Zakaluzny, he lost his shed to a fire earlier this year, then his crops to drought. So even with insurance, this will force him out of business. I can't afford to, to replace all this stuff. Eh? You know, it's just it's a lifetime a guy had, built, you know, making making it go, and now it's not worth it anymore. But like his neighbors, he's also grateful no one was hurt. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan. Well, the Tokyo 2020 Paralympic Games are officially underway in Japan. Every four years, we have an opportunity to to uh, move the Paralympic Games forward and the kind of advocacy that, that it means for people with disabilities around the world. Up next, in the midst of a global pandemic, why these games could be the most important yet. Plus, chasing the youth vote. This coming election is extremely important because it will set out the course of how this country will tackle the climate crisis for ages to come. Three young Canadians tell us about the issues that matter most to them. And later, remembering one of rock and roll's greatest drummers. We're back in two. Well, after five years of waiting, the Paralympic cauldron is shining brightly tonight as the Tokyo 2020 Games officially kick off. 162 delegations were represented at the opening ceremony, including Afghanistan. 
Its flag was on full display, even though the country's Taliban takeover had forced its two athletes to withdraw because they couldn't secure a flight out. Organizers say the flag's inclusion was an act of solidarity and a symbol for peace. Now, like the Olympic Games that ended a couple of weeks ago, the Paralympics are happening amid growing pandemic fears in Japan. But for so many athletes, the risk is well worth the trip. And as Devin Haru shows us, it's about more than just the competition. Nearly three hours of spellbinding scenes. The Paralympics opening ceremony did not disappoint. Now is your moment to show to the world your skill, your strength. More than 4,400 athletes competing in these games, the most ever. Canada! Canada! The Canadian delegation led by judoka Priscilla Gagne, 128 strong. They've arrived on this grand athletic stage in the midst of an incessant pandemic. With the cauldron now lit, the competition can officially begin. But ask five-time Paralympian Patrick Anderson, and you'll hear there's so much more at stake. Every four years, we have an opportunity to move the Paralympic Games forward and the Paralympic movement forward and the kind of advocacy that, that it means for people with disabilities around the world. With COVID cases surging in Tokyo, spectators have been shut out of the venues. So we believe uh, things will go well. We will have cases. You know, it's impossible to have zero positive cases. But the important is how you then monitor them and how you then isolate them. Team Canada chef de mission Stephanie Dixon says, so far, so good. I'm so impressed with the feedback we've heard from the athletes. I have not heard anyone's doubts about the measures. The athletes have endured their emotion evident. It was a very emotional feeling that finally, after everything I've been through, after everything the world has been through, to make it here and to be able to do what I love again, it just, it, it got to me. <laughs> A chance to inspire through their athleticism. It's why many are calling these games the most important yet. Devin Haru, CBC News, Tokyo. Now, one more note on this. Before today's opening ceremony, one of Canada's top athletes posted a personal letter to the six members of the refugee Paralympic team. Before he and his family were resettled in Canada, soccer star Alfonso Davies spent the first five years of his life at a refugee camp in Ghana. In his letter, the 20-year-old said the six athletes had the power to inspire and change lives and called them the most courageous sports team in the world. Indeed. After the break, we take a closer look at some of the big issues facing Canadians this election. My daughter and I, like, she cries and she says, Mommy, where are we going to end up? Where are we going to sleep? Are we going to become homeless? One woman's message to the next federal government about finding affordable housing in her city. But first, what younger Canadians are watching for this election? Welcome back. In this federal election, younger Canadians could play a major role for this diverse group of voters, the pandemic has only heightened challenges they were already facing. So tonight, their voice is telling Tashauna Reed about the issues they care about. Even during a pandemic, many young people have made their voices heard. And now another chance to make a difference at the ballot box this September. Hi, my name is Calvin Yang, I'm 19 years old, and the key election issue for me this year is climate change. It was in this New York City park where Calvin Yang's passion for politics began. Take me back to two years ago in Foley Square. Uh, what happened where you are right now? We organized the largest climate strike in the entire United States of America. We don't have much time left. We have until 2030 to do something fundamental here. The Canadian teenager was one of tens of thousands of young activists in New York marching to demand global climate action in 2019. After climate strike, after seeing the, the impacts that we had, not just in America and Canada, but across the world, I decided to create an organization and to help out uh, the climate efforts here in Canada. So he started a Gen Z-led, nonpartisan nonprofit called Canadian Youth Alliance for Climate Action. 
this coming election is extremely important because it will set out the course of how this country will tackle the climate crisis for ages to come. In the last year, their group met virtually with legislators and MPs across the political spectrum. They lobbied for changes to Bill C-12, the Canadian Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act. Then we have our own vision of how to make the world a better place. And I think the best way to express that and to create change, no matter how old you are, is through engaging in politics. The climate clock in New York City says time to tackle the climate crisis is running out. But Yang and his group are hopeful they can make a difference in this election. Hi, I'm Ruth Altaya. I'm 24 years old and my key election issue is economic inequality. Every day, Ruth Altaya sees the need in her community. This pandemic has only exposed the cracks within the system that we live in, uh, that we are a part of day to day. Access to food is just one of a number of big issues here exacerbated by the pandemic. Uh, two more boxes of these would be great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Ruth works for Generation Chosen, a program that serves racialized youth in Toronto's Jane and Finch neighborhood. For the past month, the group has prepared weekly food donations that have helped hundreds of people. There's a lot of promises being made about helping marginalized communities, affordable housing. There's a lot of promises made about helping the black community, mental health and helping small businesses recover from COVID. But I want them to actually make good on those promises. She'll be paying close attention to party platforms this election. Working in her community, she sees the value in being able to vote. I vote. And I cast my ballot not just for myself, but I cast my ballot for the people who just migrated to Canada and can't cast their ballot. I, I cast my ballot for people who are too young to cast their ballots, the high school students and, and the young people who are passionate about these things like policy. My ballot is more than just for me. It's for every single person that relies on my ballot. And that's why it's super important for me to vote in this election. I'm Bronwyn Hirspink. I'm 20 years old and my key election issue is the economy. We know that young people are passionate. We know that young people care about uh, political and social issues. It's just that feeling of, I feel confident enough to step into the ballot box and cast my ballot um, and feel like I'm making a change. This election, University of Regina student Bronwyn Hirspink will be busy canvassing and trying to engage youth voters in person and online job prospects and the cost of living are top of mind. As we exit the pandemic, uh, we've seen issues um, with young people's participation in the economy exacerbated, uh, specifically looking at affordability and work precarity. She'll be looking for sustainable jobs and party promises. So a, a platform that would create green jobs is, is something that I'm paying attention to, something that addresses the concerns of young people surrounding the environment and climate change, but also surrounding their concerns about, will I be able to afford a home in the future? Will I be able to earn a living wage? Bronwyn plans to vote on September 20th, as does Ruth and first-time voter Calvin. For me, this is my first election. For a lot of people, this will be their first election too. And we can really play a pivotal role and uh, shifting the future of this country towards a better place. Since the last election, an estimated 800,000 Canadians turned 18. They'll be able to cast their ballots, and party leaders are hoping they'll show up. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. For more and more Canadians of all ages, the lack of affordable housing is now beyond a political issue. It is becoming an emergency. Earlier, we looked at some campaign promises to fix the problem. So now, let's look at the crisis through the eyes of people living it in Halifax. Here's Tom Murphy. Welcome to my home. This is a beautiful apartment. This is home for Fatima Saeed. This is my kitchen. I love my kitchen. It's beautiful. We have a window. A cozy two-bedroom apartment in Halifax, the only home she's ever known since she arrived from Ethiopia 18 years ago. This is my pink, beautiful living room. Problem is, it won't be home for much longer. Her building is being sold. My landlord is telling me to move out in October. And I know why they're doing this, because they will kick us out and then they will 
rent it to somebody else in a better price. She scours the rental ads daily, finding only rents twice as high as what she can afford. Almost like $2,000. A shortage of housing is getting worse here. Mark Culligan is a community legal worker who says in 2020, Halifax had the worst vacancy rate of any major city in Canada. The number of homeless here has doubled since then. It's a crisis. We're knee deep in a crisis. It's been a crisis for several years. And patience is waning. In prominent parts of the city, temporary shelters have popped up, only to be recently pulled down by city officials, angering those who argue there's not enough being done for the homeless. In fact, in recent years, Ottawa has upped the money for housing, but critics say it still falls short. Ottawa needs to fund the construction of new social housing units. In Nova Scotia alone, uh, a new report by the CCPA in the spring estimated that we need at least 30,000 new social housing units in the next 10 years. Uh, that is the best way to address the affordable housing crisis. Right now, Halifax is a city that is already experiencing record population growth, driving up the cost of housing. And there are plans for more immigration, leaving Saeed, an interpreter and life coach for new immigrants, fearful. I don't have a place to live. I have no idea where my government is going to put those people. They don't have a house for me. They're bringing them. Where are they going to put them? And for Fatima Saeed, her eviction date looms. Sure, there's been a building boom here, an explosion of new rentals on the market, all of them too expensive for her. Come, Nadia, where do you want to eat lunch? And so this single mother asks, what am I to do? And my daughter and I, like, she cries and she says, Mommy, where are we going to end up? Where are we going to sleep? Are we going to become homeless? Saeed says it all weighs heavily on her mind. And during this federal election, she wants the politicians to develop solutions for what she says is a growing and daunting problem. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Halifax. Okay, up next, a pandemic love connection from Saskatchewan to Ohio. I hid behind a big pole. She just threw her bag. It was like, I finally get to hold my person. <laughs> we follow one cross-border couple's journey from online to finally meeting in person. And later, a different kind of journey, this time across Canada and on rollerblades. We'll be right back. Well, for so many of us, this pandemic has been about who we can't spend time with, but that has been changing. This week, the National is following six pandemic reunions, each months in the making. Tonight, it's a story of love, all the way from Regina to Springfield, Ohio. Now, it started on TikTok and ended with a new family getting together for the first time. Watch. Hey, everyone. So, you know, I've been talking to Jada and dating her for um, 11 months. Today is the first day that we are meeting in person. Her and Zayden um, just boarded their second flight. I'm so nervous. May I have your attention in maternal? Actually ended up surprising her being inside and I hid behind a big pole. She just threw her bag. It was like, I finally to hold my person. I'm Jenny Middleton and I'm from Springfield, Ohio and I'm a branch operations manager for a bank. I'm Jana Hamilton. I'm from Regina, Saskatchewan and I am a CCA at a seniors care home. Life in the pandemic for me has been a little bit lonely um, just because I met someone online and I couldn't go there and see them. It's just heartbreaking. I was just scrolling my For You page and one of her videos have popped up and I commented on it and it was just one word. It's all I had to comment and she was hooked ever since. It is safe to say I am head over heels for this beautiful woman. Around the <laughs> same time that her and I had started talking is when I had found out like my life was gonna be completely different. Finding out you're pregnant is like very difficult for people who are not planning expecting it, it and yeah. planning it. 
I didn't tell her till a little bit after just because <laughs> I wasn't sure where things were going with us. Well, first I cried, of course, because um, I was so shocked. I was like, you hid this from me kind of thing. Um, but then I thought about it and I've, I've always wanted kids. Maybe this is how it's supposed to happen. Surgery sucked, <laughs> but it was it was really scary not being able to have Jenny with me there physically. He was born March 1st. Hi, Mama. He is the most amazing little boy. I don't really have much family um, in Regina. It's just him and I. Which is very hard, too, because you want to be their support system. We were on FaceTime, like, all day, every day. 20 hours a day was our average. Even doing like our daily tasks, we would FaceTime each other. When we went to bed, we would FaceTime each other. I got to know her in a completely different way that if, if you were here for the first couple of months, maybe I wouldn't have got us so deep so fast. Um, so I'm, I'm thankful for it, but it also sucked at the same time. <laughs> I love you and I miss you, baby. Thanks, Jada. I look at the border stuff every single day at work, and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm never gonna get to see her. We finally met at the Columbus airport. As soon as I was able to hug her, like my whole life just felt complete. It was like a so real moment. It's like a piece of us were missing for so many months. Are you ready to change your poop? But I missed four months of his life, but it was beautiful at the same time. So was like, that's my little boy. And I, I can't wait to see like all this first. And I've seen it through a phone, but it's different when he's right in front of my face. It feels normal. It doesn't feel like I have to get to know her all over again. I think it's safe to say that Zayden is also incredibly happy to be here with Mama. I would like um, Jada and Zayden to move here. We talked about like K-1 visa process. We're most looking forward to just spending time together. Getting to know each other in a different way. Just the, the small things that mean the most. Just hugging your partner or making your baby laugh. Things like that. Oh man. We need more of those. Uh, and we've got more coming your way. We'll have long-awaited pandemic reunions uh, all of this week on The National. Tomorrow, it's a hug between a grandmother and her grandchildren after a, a complicated journey halfway around the world. Still ahead, the legacy of a legendary drummer. Condolences to the Stones. This will be a huge blow to them because Charlie was a rock. Um, and a fantastic drummer. How the Rolling Stones' Charlie Watts is being remembered by his peers and his fans. This election, your vote matters. CBC News is here to provide you with the election tools you need to make an informed decision. Informed by you. Canada Votes 2021. Well, I feel a responsibility to stand up for humanity. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, the harrowing tale of an Afghan doctor currently hiding from the Taliban and his Canadian wife trying to make their way to Canada. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. I mean, you could play a whole 98-piece drum sequence down there. And if you got in a studio, all you need to do is bang your foot. It's a totally different thing you're dealing with. Hmm, that's Charlie Watts yeah. more than 50 years well, ago talking to the CBC then about we, what he loved I, making know, music. The, the legendary drummer of the Rolling Stones has died just three weeks after the band announced he would not be joining them on their upcoming tour. Eli Glasner now with the legacy the 80-year-old Watts leaves behind. With the internally exuberant guitarist Keith Richards on one side and the tireless Mick Jagger out front, Charlie Watts looked like a guy just doing a job. But that was part of his genius in the band, not competing with, but knitting its elements together. 
Besides, try to imagine the Stone's satisfaction without his straight-ahead snare, or the marching tempo driving painted black. I see a and I want it painted black. In one of the world's hottest rock bands, Charlie Watts brought the jazz cool. It seems simple on one level, but as a drummer, I'm telling you, he will open up the hi-hat in places where you don't expect, and he moves the song forward. And, you know, there's not a single song that ends at the same tempo that it begins. Born in London in 1941, he discovered jazz in his early teens, and then in his early 20s, a rock band called the Rolling Stones. But even when it became a global touring machine, the dapper drummer never looked for the spotlight. There's a lot of different things to do. It's interesting, but it's a bit frantic. For me, it's too much. This music writer says Watts is what kept the Stones together. Charlie was probably one of the only people who could keep them in line uh, and who they both, I am very certain, respected deeply. In 2004, when Watts was battling throat cancer, Keith Richards said, if there's no Charlie, there's no Stones. As the news spread today, rock and roll royalty, Brian Wilson, Joan Jett, Robbie Robertson, and more all sang his praises. Condolences to the Stones. This would be a huge blow to them because Charlie was a rock um, and a fantastic drummer. Charlie! There's no word on whether the Rolling Stones will move forward, but Watts' signature sound, that swinging backbeat, will continue resonating as long as their music is played. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Well, next, how far would you rollerblade to break a world record? Well, this Canadian decided to go coast to coast. It is our moment. But first, here's a preview of a story we will have tomorrow night on The National. My conversation with Billie Jean King about the sports world then and now. Do you like to write a lot? Sure, I guess you have to for, for sure. this show, right? I can't believe where you travel to. And I'm with the Tennis show. icon Billie Jean King has questions about everyone and everything. To chat with her is to get a gentle grilling. Did you play hockey as a kid? No, I, I, no. But as a warrior in the lifelong pursuit of equality in sport, she has answers too. And all those stories. Really, you mean to say you think I put women down? About Bobby Riggs and the battle of the sexes, about pressures on athletes then and now, and one of the most critical and difficult moments of her life. It feels like that was stolen from you. Yeah, it feels like it was stolen. All in with Billie Jean King tomorrow on The National. This election, your vote matters. CBC News is here to provide you with the election tools you need to make an informed decision. Informed by you. Canada Votes 2021. It's the ultimate sand sculpting showdown. Go big or go home. We're coming for you. I want to win. But their toughest opponent is sweet mother nature. <sighs> it's not just a beach battle. It's a race against the tide. Well, this is Zach Chaboter crossing the finish line after rollerblading across the country for 91 days. And then he took a little dip. Uh, his mission was twofold, earn an entry into the Guinness Book of World Records and raise awareness for the environment. I'd say he succeeded, and he is tonight's moment. I literally just finished rollerblading across the country. Uh, 10,000 kilometers, broke a Guinness World Record. I originally wanted to do something crazy. I was inspired to do something a little bit off the beaten path. And then I'm really passionate about the environment. And someone was like, oh, you should call it blading for bees. And bees are such a good mascot for the environment. If we help them, we help everything. It took a little while at the beginning for my body to get used to it. But if you can mentally focus on something and your body adjusts, it's really, it's kind of like a science experiment. It's really cool. So the previous world record was held by this guy named Peter in Germany. There's not a lot of info on him, so if somehow he sees this, Peter, reach out to me. I broke that in, we were in right along the border of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. Really cool moment as well. We knew we still had about 1,500 kilometers to go, so we were still <laughs> in the zone and focused. We had a little celebration that night, and then, kept yeah, <laughs> we kept going. So the current record, I guess, now is a little yeah. over 10,000. 
right now I'm just happy to be done and I don't have to wake up and rollerblade tomorrow and she doesn't have to wake up and <laughs> try to get him to rollerblade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I love though this is a pair that seems really driven right yeah. and, and of course there is the the cause behind it so you know raising awareness for the importance of, of bees around the world but I also just love that, that he seems to have this kind of intellectual curiosity right like I wonder what would happen if I broke the world record like I he mean, liked to do a science experiment right? he could have tried I yeah. don't buy it that your body gets used to it I, look, I, I just don't buy it <laughs> how could it right? he did say that the hardest thing though was actually keeping track getting the evidence in the right order for the Guinness Book of World Records right I wouldn't have thought that was the hardest thing but anyway right. that is a national for August 24th good night good night